Laura. Thanks for being with me today on Let's Talk Leadership. Well, thank you, Barbara. Thanks for including me. Well, I think you have so much to offer for the young leaders who are watching this on uh, YouTube. Um, I've always just been so impressed with hearing your presentation about diversity and inclusion and uh, reading your book, which I just happened to hear. Maybe you can tell us what, what in the world that title meant, The Loudest Duck. And, and I think your experience as the Managing Director of Global Leadership and Diversity at Goldman Sachs gives you the opportunity to share lots of your experience, your lessons learned, and your stories with, with the folks watching this day. So I'm not going to say any more. I'd like you to talk to us about why diversity and inclusion is so important and what's the impact if we have it or if we don't have it. Absolutely. You know, in some ways, it's an easy answer um, in terms of why diversity is so important. And let's make sure we say diversity and inclusion uh, into the conversation. Uh, because if we say, how is it that an organization wants to do its best, wants to ensure that it has employees who feel included and satisfied and fully functional, how does an organization feel like they are um, ahead of the competition, for example, um, that they're getting the best ideas. The cornerstone, cornerstone of that is diversity. So in an ironic sort of way, diversity is not a goal in and of itself. The, the diversity is going to be the tool and the vehicle to get you where you want to go. Um, I, you know, I always like to quote, uh, James Sarah Wiki in his book, The Wisdom of the Crowd. He says, look, if you've got a homogeneous group of people and you add another member of the homogeneous group to the homogeneous group, they bond quite quickly, but their incremental creativity and innovation are slight. If you add a member of the heterogeneous group to the homogeneous group, they may not bond as quickly because they're not alike. They're not, they're not alike. But he says the incremental creativity and innovation are much greater. So when I think when I think about diversity, I think about why we should focus on it. In addition to the just the whole notion of equality and justice, you know, which are underpinnings of all of this, you know, we're really looking for how do we get the best out of everyone? How do we make sure we get everyone's experiences and everyone's ideas and everyone's backgrounds into the organization itself? Now, having said that. It's not easy. It's just not easy. And one of the challenges, I think, is a lot of organizations think, gosh, if I could only find that silver bullet, you know, that would solve the problem. Well, as we talk further, you'll hear that I think that that's a lot harder than people think it is. You said something that I think is very meaningful, that diversity in and of itself is not the goal. That, and I think way too many organizations today are just counting numbers. And, and if we get these percentages, then, then we're okay. And, yeah. and so we are diverse. And you and I have both worked in organizations where they've made those numbers, but then those heterogeneous folks, the others, do not feel included. Can you talk some about that? Yeah, absolutely. Because what you're describing is what I call the Noah's Ark approach to diversity, you know, the sort of God, if we get only just get two of each in the ark, we'll have our diversity, you know. But uh, just so happens I'm on the board of the Friends of the National Zoo, so I have a lot of zoo examples, a lot of animal examples. So one of the things I say is, look at if the giraffe is looking at the zebra, you know, in the ark, and he's looking at it, and he says, gosh, you're funny looking. How do you do anything with that stupid short neck of yours? This eye giraffe had this beautiful, long, very, you know, functional neck. And looks and he says, why, why do you have those silly black and white stripes? Because I have beautiful brown fur, you know, and I only eat the freshest leaves off the top of the tree. You know, if you actually saw what a junk a zebra eats, you'd be amazed. Okay? <laughs> so my point is, is that we can get everybody in the ark, but unconsciously, People are looking at each other and going, boy, you're funny looking. Boy, you act differently. There must be something wrong with you. you know? Or they have what people have often called unconscious biases about who other people are. 
I call that unconscious archetypes and perspectives and preferences and roles and associations. We all bring all of that stuff into the workplace with us. And if we're doing that, bringing all this unconscious stuff in, then that's what you're describing. We're not getting what we said we wanted from this diversity. Yeah, that kind of creativity and innovation that you were talking about. Yeah. Well, creativity, innovation, and an individual sense that, hey, I work in a meritocracy. It's a level playing field. You know, there's sort of equal justice for all. No one is getting subtly advantaged or subtly disadvantaged in the organization. You know, I remember one organization, um, and the topic was meritocracy. And I did focus groups with people in the organization. And one of the, it's an American company. One of the groups was American white men. Another group was women. The third group were other historically underrepresented groups in America. And the fourth group were non-Americans. Okay, so those were the four groups talking about meritocracy in their organization. And I went back to the senior leadership and I said, I have great news for you. One of these groups thinks this organization is a meritocracy. Now, if you remember the four groups I had, we can get can imagine. <laughs> yeah. Because no one gets to the top of an organization and says, well, you know, boy, I got to the top of this organization because I was subtly advantaged. Nobody says that. They say, I got to the top of this organization because I'm smart and it's a level playing field and only the best get to the top. Little understanding and knowing what the hidden hurdles are for other historically underrepresented groups, what I call the non-dominant groups. You know? right. And that's one of the challenges that we all have to figure out. You know? And that's not just as, an in, as a corporation or an organization, it's as individuals. We have to really begin to understand that the way we walk in the world is not necessarily the way other people have to walk in the world. And that's, you know, you can call it empathy, you can call it emotional intelligence, whatever, but it's a realization and we've seen it, you know, in the news that, you know, not all of us have the same set of experiences in interacting with officials or officers, police officers or whatever. So, you know, that to me is a major necessity of a diverse organization. And so, Laura, I know that you've traveled around the world in, in your role as senior advisor uh, at Goldman Sachs. And, and so... What have you seen as you've traveled around the world in terms of kind of lessons of who's doing it right and in the cases of where it's not being done right, what, what can be changed? Well, yes, I've done, I have gone around the world seeing a lot of this and the dynamics, not only within work corporations, but with in international organizations. And I know you do a lot of work for international organizations like the World Bank. Um, you see... Some of the, you always see a dynamic of dominant groups and non-dominant groups. You know, the groups may be different, but you always see some of that dynamic going on. You know, and I think the best organizations are not just the ones who tout, you know, a program that they're doing, like a mentoring program. Not that they're wrong, but, you know, a lot of organizations think they have the foundation for diversity efforts because they have a, diversity team, senior leadership talks about how important it is. They have a council or something. They have employee resource groups. They have training. All of those things, I think those are necessary, but they're, you know, not sufficient. Mm -hmm. And I'm a lawyer, so you know, I can say those kind of cranky things. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so they're necessary, but not sufficient. And that's because, as I said before, we're bringing our unconscious in. We're bringing what I call grandma what grandma taught us. Now, that's not your grandma. That's just the society and how we learned who other people are. And we all bring those, our grandmas, to work with us. So organizations that get more understanding of those dynamics are actually going to make things change. You know? But those organizations that just say, well, I'm going to put a program in place, and that's going to do it, and, boy, that's going to get me some good publicity, that's not going to, it's not going to work. It's actually what... Cheryl Kaiser out of the University of Washington calls the illusion of inclusion. Mm -hmm. Programs like that are, then they have the illusion that we're doing a lot for the organization. But as you pointed out, the outcomes, you know, people get very frustrated because we're putting all this money into these programs and nothing's changing. No. 
We're not retaining our talents. You know, we're not increasing the number of historically underrepresented groups to the top. People still don't feel like they're included. We're still not getting, some people are getting overheard. Some people are getting underheard. Yeah. And that's, incidentally, you asked the origin of the name of the book, The Loudest Duck. Yeah. And, Dude, tell us that story, please. Well, it's, it, it's, it's not so much a story as a descriptor, because mm-hmm. basically, um, I would say in America, many people are taught the uh, squeaky wheel gets the grease. Speak up, you get what you want. Fine. But I know for a fact that a lot of places in the world don't, their grandma didn't teach them, teach them that. Because, for example, when I go to Japan and I say, so what does it mean the squeaky wheel gets the grease? Nobody does. Nobody. Because they're taught by grandma, the nail that sticks out gets hit on the head, which actually means don't speak up. Right? And women, we've heard this phrase, are often taught if you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. And the Chinese are taught the loudest duck gets shot. And becomes so, a speaking duck. <laughs> well, can become whatever. But in the, in the case of the organization, if you have a diverse organization, which you say you want, and you have a wheel, a duck, a nail, and a nice, the only person you're likely to be hearing is the wheel because they've been taught, speak up and you get what you want. But everybody else has been taught, don't speak up. Yeah. And so you get this diverse organization and you say you want the diversity, but you're overhearing the, the wheel and you're underhearing the nail duck nice. So from my perspective, organizations, you say what good organizations do, they need to actually train their managers in the heterogene- heterogeneity which is what this is, and say, look at your responsibility here is to make sure you bring in these people who aren't normally talking. So you actually have to do something, what I call being a traffic cop, because I was a traffic cop for a number of years, and an officer, reserve sergeant in the Metropolitan Police Department. You know, and so you have to, you know, the manager has to be in the meeting and say, hold on wheel, let the duck speak. You know, hold on wheel, let the nice speak. So they have to affirmatively do something because if you don't and you let it flow in a sort of, oh, well, this is just the way it is kind of thing, you're only going to hear certain people. And that, that diversity that you said you wanted, you didn't get. So that's the origin of, of this whole notion of the, the loudest duck. Well, and I, I like your description of the meeting and, and thinking about the manager and, and, the person who then is going to say, all right, does anyone else have something to share? And then making the assumption, since no one has something else to share, that everyone agrees. Correct. And that is often not the case. No, that's almost absolutely not the case. I think that's one of the worst sentences you could say in a conference call or a meeting. Does anyone else have anything to say? No. You have to say, let's hear from Barbara now. Because some people in some cultures have been taught Do not speak unless invited to speak. And so you, manager, and I call that the seed in the soil. The soil is the the manager who has to affirmatively do these things. Now, I will also tell the seed, the individual, who's not speaking out, for example, is, well, wait a minute. You have a 50% responsibility here to get a little out of your comfort zone, tell grandma to go home, and speak up because your ideas are valuable. And we didn't hire you to not give your ideas out. So, uh, you know, I kind of balance the responsibility of the manager and the responsibility of the individual. But for sure, the manager has that or the people, person who's leading. Now, I'll also say there's some techniques to this, you know, just in case the manager doesn't do this. And this I would suggest for your listeners, you know, particularly your younger listeners to get this tool going, is that you, Barbara, can say, you know, we really haven't heard from Laura today. I'd like to hear from Laura. You can do that. You can be someone's wing person on this kind of thing, you know, and you could do, for example, we know there's some gendered statistics around who gets interrupted, you know, mm-hmm. and particularly for younger women, I think it's really important to make sure that their voice gets heard, you know, to make sure that they're at the table, that people don't just sit behind the table when they come into the room, that they say they have things to say. They tell people they have things to say. They, when they get interrupted, 
you know, either they can say, you know, thanks, John, I really want to hear what you have to say, but let me finish, you know, or you, Barbara, the wing person can say, you know, hold on, John, let Mary finish, you know, you can do that kind of thing. Now, ideally, the manager says, hold on, John, let Mary finish, but that sometimes doesn't happen. But if you get interrupted, where did your ideas go? They're gone. You know, if you get talked over, if you get, you know, I don't necessarily like the word, but it's, you know, a descriptor, mansplain, you know, because some men get mansplained too, you know, by dominant group members, you know, but if somebody is, you know, telling people what you just said, you know, you can just say, thanks, John, for repeating what I just said. You, know, you have to do these kinds of things because there's so many dynamics going on in an organization that will subtly advance you or subtly keep you back. So you, for example, for younger people, I say, tell your manager what you want. What, what next step do you want? Ask your manager, what do I need to do to get to this next step? You know, I often say to people, because getting feedback is often hard when you're younger, to get feedback from your, your manager, particularly if, if the manager is not like you, that they don't, they are not in a similar homogeneous group, right? Managers are often reluctant to give that feedback. But Linda Hill, Harvard Business School, two people start at the same place. One gets critical feedback, one gets stretch assignments, and one gets mentoring and sponsoring, and the other does not. In five years' time, there is a performance difference between oh, the two. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think one of the points that, that I've heard you talk about before that, that maybe we can can just mention before we close today is the concept of, of that dominant group and the things that they may do that they don't even realize tend to be put downs to others. Can, can you address that for a minute? Well, it, it, there, you know, again, we all walk in the world differently. You know, and if you walk in the world as a dominant group member, um, your competencies and capabilities will never be questioned. Yeah. Or what I say is, you know, you, you know that, that, that at first you won't be. But the minute you start speaking, then somebody might say, whoa, you're not a leader. But your assumption is you are a leader until you disprove it, right? Whereas non-dominant groups, the assumption is you're not a leader until you prove it. So those are two very different things, right? So, you know, one person comes in, everyone assumes they're the leader. They give them the benefit of the doubt. They do what's known as confirmation bias. They look for that which they already believe, the people. And the non-dominant group has the same thing in the sense of, well, we think, you know, we unconsciously think you're incompetent until you prove you're competent, right? And so if I think you're unconsciously incompetent, I start sorting for the, you know, the first time you, Barbara, say, you know, I just really don't know the answer to that. You know, I'll find it out, but I don't know. And you go, click, you know, not particularly competent. You just said you didn't know. Whereas a competent person, who you assume was a competent person, they go, you know, I really don't know. I'll find out. Oh, good. They're going to find out. They really know what they're doing. So these kinds of things, you know, I mean, there's been all sorts of, you know, research around. And some, I think your, your audience will know the blind audition notion where, you know, auditioning behind a screen. So you can remove, in this particular case, the gender bias around that because there's assumptions about women musicians and men musicians. And the screen helps prevent that kind of thing. You see that on shows like The Voice. Yeah. And that's, they're trying to prevent people from having these unconscious assumptions about dominant group members and non dominant group members. So there are lots of things that if we know how to overcome them, we, we can try. But, but we have to know and we have to make a conscious choice to do that. We have to know. We have to make a conscious to- choice to do things. We have to become aware you know, sometimes I'm, I, maybe I'm just a little cynical, but, you know, it may be that we can't overcome all the unconscious things in our head. It's possible. But becoming aware that we have these things in our head, you know, it does allow us to reframe how we think about other people. But most importantly, we have to give people um, behavior to, tools to change their behaviors about things. So, you know, I know from some the company I worked with that, you know, the men were getting assigned these big projects and the women were getting assigned these others and the other historically underrepresented groups were getting assigned the not quite as good projects, you know. Well, what we had to do is we had to literally log out all of this stuff 
and say to the managers, look, you may not realize this, but this is what's happening. You know, men are going this, women, are, people of color are getting this, you know. And the managers instantly, when you do that, are appalled. They have no idea that they're doing this. So then you say, okay, you better figure out a regularized way to do assignments that will eliminate this unconscious. And you better track yourself, you know, and you better hold yourself accountable. These things. So my point is, is that, you know, I think we can educate ourselves. I think we can help learn how to walk in other people's shoes. I think we can understand that other people have different experiences than we have. And then we need to develop the tools to make sure that we overcome all of these sort of unconscious beliefs. Laura, thank you. I, I I again am so impressed with the the knowledge, the depth of knowledge that you have. I, I appreciate that no end, um, and I I think that we can reliably end on that note that it's not checking off a box that you've done a program, but awareness is so important, and then finding out those behavioral tools that will help you be less, help one to be less uh, biased, get grandma out of our heads. And look around and see what the reality is as, as we really seek to get the benefits of diversity, not just to count the numbers, but to get the benefit. Yes, and I think that rightly so, particularly young people are very, very, you know, very, feel very strongly about social justice issues. Yeah. And this is all part of that. So thank you, Barbara. Well, I, I uh, am very pleased that you wanted to spend time with us today. Thank you so much. Uh, and um, let's talk leadership. Thanks.